Um, welcome everyone to the University of Minnesota China Center's Considering, Webina Considering China webinar. I'm Joan Brzezinski and I am the director of the China Center. We are thrilled to welcome Dr. Leda Hong Fincher today. Her presentation is Population Decline and the Future of Women's Rights in China. First, allow me to thank you for your support of the China Center and this webinar series. Your generosity helps make the programs like these possible. I offer a special thanks to Kai Mei and Joseph Terry for their generous support of this program. And we invite you to support the, the China Center and advance our mission by giving to the China Center through the link on the webinar announcement or on our website. So let's get started. Dr. Hong Fincher is a critically acclaimed author. Her books, Leftover Woman in 2014 and Betraying Big Brother in 2018 have received wide um, praise. A letter this year, in November, an updated 10th anniversary edition of Leftover Women will be published by Bloomsbury. She's also written for the New York Times, Washington Post, um, The Guardian, BBC, CNN, and others. She won the Society of Professional Journalists Sigma Delta Chi Award for her China reporting. Dr. Hong Fincher is the first American to receive a PhD in sociology from Tsinghua University. She has a master's from Stanford University and bachelor's degree with high honors from Harvard University. At the end of the program, Dr. Hong Fincher will answer the questions that you submit through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So um, welcome, Dr. Hong Fincher. <laughs> Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Joan, and thank you for uh, this invitation from University of Minnesota's China Center. Um, this is actually the first talk that I, I'm giving since finishing updating, um, significantly updating my first book, Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China. And um, so there, there's a lot of material. Um, I decided to call this webinar Population Decline and the Future of Women's Rights in China. Um, but there's, there's just, actually there's a lot that you can tell about what might be the future by looking at the recent and not so recent past. Um, let me just share uh, my presentation here. And I hope that everybody can see this. Oh, I'm actually at the, sorry, I'm at the end of it. Um, okay, so hopefully you can all see this. Um, this is just the, the cover for the 10th anniversary edition of Leftover Women, the Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China, which is going to be published um, on November 2nd by Bloomsbury. So um, let me just get started by looking at this issue of population decline in China. It is an absolutely seismic demographic turning point. Um, let's just look at this very briefly. Um, I found a couple of useful graphs from the Pew Research Center and also Reuters graphics showing how China's fertility rate has uh, decreased uh, significantly, dramatically in recent years. Um, but last year was the first time that China's population actually declined since the 1960s when uh, the country was experiencing the catastrophic Great Leap Forward famine. Um, so that, that has very deep, wide-ranging ramifications for the entire world, um, which I'm not really going to get into, but um, how is it that, uh, that the Chinese government basically reversed its very draconian so-called one-child policy, which was in place for over 30 years? Um, it, reversed the policy or it eased the policy at the end of 2015. It decided to introduce a so-called two-child policy, allowing um, urban married couples in China to have two children instead of one. Um, and then if you look at these graphs, you'll see that 
uh, there really wasn't any impact. I mean, there was a tiny little bit of a bump in the fertility rate right after the government eased the one child policy. But then ever since uh, 2016 or 2017, the birth rate has been declining continuously. Um, and then in 2021, the Chinese government uh, tried to ease the population controls even further by introducing a quote, three child policy, which uh, applies to everybody who is married. Um, it does not yet extend to people who are unmarried. Um, and I'm gonna get into why that is in a minute about the importance of marriage. Um, marriage in China is heterosexual. It's between a man and a woman. Same-sex marriage is illegal. Um, so this is sort of the uh, population background, looking at dramatically declining birth rates. Um, then we also see here, this is a Bloomberg graph that is kind of useful looking at the number of marriage registrations that the marriage rate has also been plummeting in recent years. Um, and this graph ends in 2021, but the marriage rate continues to fall as well. Um, so what lies behind these changes? I mean, these demographic changes have actually been underway for many years now. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit to look at something that I call China's patriarchal authoritarianism. I actually wrote more about this particular uh, patriarchal authoritarianism um, under Xi Jinping in my last book, Betraying Big Brother, The Feminist Awakening in China, which came out in 2018. And so for those of you who are interested, I mean, there's a lot more material um, in these books, but um, but Xi Jinping uh, has uh, has now. I mean, he's he's done away with, or the uh, China's Congress has done away with presidential term limits, and so he is now entering his third term as General Secretary of the Communist Party. Um, and it's pretty clear that. He uh, has, or he is striving for a level of influence that nobody has seen in China really since the days of Mao Zedong. Um, and, and a lot of people have written about the personality cult surrounding Xi Jinping. Um, something that is very important, I believe, about the personality cult is that it is also very hyper masculine. Um, just to give you an example, in in Xi Jinping's first major speech after assuming leadership of the Communist Party in January of 2013, he gave a, a speech about the collapse of the Soviet Union. And he said, the Soviet Communist Party had more members than we do, but nobody was man enough to stand up and resist. And so he was using this speech to present himself as being the strong man, the paternalistic patriarch who was going to do whatever it took, uh, who's going to be more ruthless to uh, ensure that the Communist Party remains in power in China, certainly longer than it did in the Soviet Union. Um, that he's, he's man enough to um, impose very tough policies. Uh, unlike Gorbachev, he actually says in this this speech, he he calls out Gorbachev as not being strong enough. Um, so something that just happened that was announced a few days ago, actually, um, was this Global Times, which is the uh, which is part of the state media. It announced that China is launching pilot projects in, in uh, 20 more cities to build a so-called new era marriage and child rearing culture. Um, and these pilot projects are designed to encourage young people to get married and have children at quote, appropriate, appropriate ages. Uh, we're gonna get into that in just a minute. What is the appropriate age? 
for women to be getting married and having babies. Um, there is a history behind that as well. But you'll see that um, just to stay on Xi Jinping a little bit longer, that effectively shortly after he um, became general secretary of the Communist Party, he started pushing um, uh, very um, traditionally virtuous images of uh, models of virtuous wives and mothers in the home who uh, have babies, who take care of the children, they take care of the elderly, they make sure that the home is very harmonious, um, while the men are the ones who go out and are the breadwinners and they participate in paid employment. Um, another thing that I'm not going to get into with this webinar, but is very, very important is um, that the government in China is making it much more difficult to get divorced. So uh, that's in response, in part in response to falling marriage rates and falling birth rates. But in 2021, the government introduced what they called a divorce cooling off period. Um, and that since then, it, it's become a lot more difficult for women in particular to get a divorce. Um, and I would refer you to actually an excellent book that is open access um, that was written by the sociologist Ethan Michelson called Decoupling. And it's a very thorough, uh, really detailed look at divorce and domestic violence in China. Um, these are not topics that I'm gonna be talking about in the main presentation, but you're welcome to ask me with the Q&A and I can talk a little bit more about that. So um, I just wanna go uh, show you a little bit more about um, Xi Jinping and the role of the family and family values. Um, so in 2017, I, I just took these screen grabs. These are from um, CCTV, the Chinese state television. Um, Xi Jinping propaganda began talking about this idea of the quote, family state under heaven, Jia Guo Tian Xia, which uh, kind of presents him, Xi, as a strongman authoritarian ruling over these male dominated families. And um, for those of you who speak Chinese, the role of the word for uh, country or nation in Chinese is guojia, which is a compound word. Um, so guo uh, here means um, country and jia is the word for family, this character here. And Xi Jinping had this long piece about how Xi, quote, Xi stresses the importance of family values. He says little family, but he has in mind the big family. Guojia, the big family is the Chinese nation state. So this propaganda, the ideology really presents the country of China, the nation state as this agglomeration of many millions of little families. It's a big family with Xi Jinping at the top, the paternalistic patriarch father figure. Um, and it's made of millions and millions of little families. And everybody has to play their correct role in this little family in order to preserve the stability of the big family, the big nation state of China. Um, a lot of this family values propaganda that you see, continue to see being pushed in the state media is reflective of or harks back to um, Confucian principles of womanly virtue. And here I'm just going to lip, give a little quote from uh, Qing Dynasty text, Biographies of Exemplary Women, Lian Yujuan. Um, quote, the daughter obeys her parents, the daughter-in-law reverently serves her parents-in-law, the wife assists her husband, the mother guides her sons and daughters. When every family is harmonious, the state is well governed. And by the way, these pictures of Xi Jinping are here he is with his elderly mother. Um, he's taking care of her. He's being the filial son. And here he is with his young daughter at the time who's now grown up. 
So he he's playing his role as well. He has his little family, just like all the other citizens in China. So um, so if you know, go back briefly to this um, announcement about these pilot projects, they're going to be pushing quote unquote new era marriage culture. New era refers to the Xi Jinping era. And you'll also see in the state media references to new era women. These are what women are supposed to be, especially young women um, in, in China, the new era women. And, and on the right, there's this picture here um, from, so as you can see as well through the dates, this is, this has actually been going on for quite a few years. So this particular picture is from March of 2018 um, in Jiangsu province. And, and this is presented by the All China Women's Federation, which was running classes to, to teach young women to be the new era woman, to raise, quote unquote, raise the quality of young women. Um, this is something that I write quite a lot about, um, and I write about it in, in the updated version of Leftover Women as well, um, is the notion that um, the population, controlling the population is not just about controlling the quantity at all, it's, uh, it's about uh, sculpting a so-called high quality or gao su zhi, um, high quality population. And so, these classes run by the All China Women's Federation, the state agency for women. Um, the classes were designed to just teach posture, grooming, and makeup of quote unquote traditional culture. You see these kinds of images um, and news reports and columns all over, um, all over China today. Um, and I have put a quote here. This is actually going all the way back to 2011. And so you'll, you'll see that um, 2011 actually preceded um, Xi Jinping's assumption of, of office in China. That was under Hu Jintao. And so these pressures, the propaganda pushing women into um, these very traditional roles has been going on uh, actually ever going all the way back to at least 27, uh, 2007. But this is really worth reading because um, you'll get an idea of the extreme sexism that, that, is, ex that is really prevalent in state media. Um, this was a column that was written um, on and, and disseminated by Xinhua News. And it says, quote, pretty girls don't need a lot of education to marry into a rich and powerful family, but girls with an average or ugly appearance will find it difficult. These kinds of girls hope to further their education in order to increase their competitiveness. The tragedy is they don't realize that as women age, they are worth less and less. So by the time they get their MA or PhD, they are already old, like yellowed pearls. So that is one example of um, the propaganda surrounding this this term of leftover woman or sheng nu that was very heavily pushed by China's propaganda starting in 2007. Um, and in brief, I write a lot about it in uh, my uh, updated book as well about leftover women, but, but basically what this term leftover woman means is it was coined by the government and propagated by the government is it refers to women um, who are in their mid twenties or older who are single. And it generally means women who are college educated and professional, but, um, but it was very heavily pushed by the propaganda apparatus in 2007. So um, before I show you some examples of what that, propaganda looks like, I actually want to go back to much earlier propaganda in China. And here, for example, is a propaganda poster from 1954. Um, and it shows these, these kinds of images of women back in the 1950s and 60s and even 70s showed women 
in traditionally masculine roles. So this one is a welder and um, the slogan at the bottom of the poster is, we are proud to participate in the founding of our country's industrialization. So this was just a few years after the 1949 um, success of the communist revolution and the founding of the People's Republic of China. And uh, a major policy initiative of Mao Zedong's at the time was to uh, mandate full employment for all women in China. So in, in the cities, all women were assigned jobs in factories and in the countryside, which at the time was of course, most of the population, the women were assigned to go work in the fields. Um, here are some more propaganda posters. This is an example from 1971. I mean, you know, the stereotypical criticize the landlord and capitalist classes. But <laughs> you really, if you just take a look at this image here, this is a this is a poster about women working, and the 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 main uh, figure is um, I mean it doesn't say that she's a woman, but this is a poster for women, and and the the figure there is extraordinarily muscular and powerful. Um, actually, you know, could be rather gender fluid by um, our way of thinking today, but this is. This is a representation of women and the ideal kind of woman um, in 1971 and earlier that these are women who are, women across China are supposed to go and work for the country to build the economy, to industrialize China. And um, here is another propaganda poster from the early 1970s. And it shows um, a woman, another woman in, in a stereotypically masculine job as a welder. And the slogan is, late marriage is a revolutionary requirement. So um, when the People's Republic was founded in 1949 and for a few decades thereafter, the Communist Party's uh, main goal was, well, not main goal, but one of their one of their uh, important goals with regard to women and men and marriage was to get rid of child marriage. They got rid of polygamy and concubinage. Um, and they were trying to encourage um, later marriage so that women could defer childbirth, defer marriage um, and spend, you know, spend the earlier years um, of a woman's life going and working without being distracted um, by uh, having children. So um, that is sort of a very brief recap of the history of propaganda about Chinese women. I um, mean, in, in 2007, a very dramatically different kind of propaganda was surfaced and pushed. Um, and that is the idea of this leftover woman. And um, I'm not gonna get into too much background. Maybe you can ask me more about why it was doing this, but certainly uh, certainly a big factor was that the party could see that um, as women became more educated, they were deferring marriage and childbirth. And so um, the propaganda apparatus, um, actually shortly before this, leftover women term was rolled out by the state media in China, um, the S Chinese state council issued this important policy about um, its population and how the government needed to try to quote, improve the quality or raise the quality of China's population because the population quality in quotes, the population quality was considered to be too low to build the kind of competitive nation that China needs to be um, for the future, to build you know, the knowledge-based economy and skilled workers that will make China very competitive internationally in the future. So um, this was what the government thought would be really good um, in 2007, that this would kind of, um, it would be a scaremongering campaign 
taking aim at those women who are trying to um, pursue more advanced degrees and basically telling them that if they don't hurry up and get married, they're never going to find a husband. Um, so the so the propaganda actually started with a women age 25 years old um, and and they had these uh, subcategories, quote unquote subcategories of leftover women with different names for the subcategory, starting with the category of women age 25 to 27. If you look at this image, what unites a lot of the propaganda imagery is that um, the women that they depict have this mortarboard on their head, indicating that the woman has graduated from college and or maybe she even has a, a master's degree. Um, so here's another uh, label for women 28 to 30 years old. Um, I translated it as the ones who must triumph. Quote, their careers leave them no time for the hunt. So I'm, I'm taking this language, by the way, from a Xinhua News article, but there were so many different um, state media articles that were incredibly sexist, um, just insulting of educated women in their 20s who had not married. And, and again, this picture as well, See, you see the woman has a mortarboard on her head. Um, and then the next category up is women aged 31 to 35, um, quote, high level leftover women battle to survive in the cruel workplace, but are still single. So if you look at the image here, you'll see variations on this pattern recurring over and over and over again. Um, it's the women are placed on a kind of pedestal and they're standing above these categories. The first one is gao xue li, which is high education, gao zhi, which is good or high professional um, level, and gao xin, which is high income. So these are these women are educated, they've at least got a college degree, and because, because they're so qualified and educated, they're standing up here um, and they're looking for men. This is the implication. It's not even the implication. It's this is directly stated in a lot of the propaganda that these women are just too quote unquote picky. And the propaganda is advising these women or pushing these women, insulting them and saying, you have to lower your standards. You need to marry, you know, don't be so picky about who you decide to marry. Meanwhile, there are all these men. Um, and because of China's sex ratio imbalance, uh, there are millions more men than women. And that's also related to uh, more than 30 years of this draconian population planning policies known as the one child policy. Um, so another bit of propaganda here, uh, finding a partner should be as easy as blowing away a speck of dust. Uh, so you see again, these are images of women placed on a very high level of pedestal, kind of feeling happy about their accomplishments, but they're not able to find a man to marry. Um, and it just gives you, and here's another very crude image of this woman 35 and older, who is, I translate as the great sage equal of heaven. She has quote, a luxury apartment, private car and a company. So why did she become a leftover woman? And if you look at the image and you see this really all over the place. Um, so the woman has, she's, these other characters beneath her are the different names that the propaganda apparatus has given to the lower levels, younger women who are also quote unquote leftover women. But this is the one at the top. She's the oldest and she is so-called, you know, she's wearing this um, tawdry kind of golden crown, but she has, it's really a very gory image. She's just brutally slaughtered all of these other figures. And there's the, the word love at the bottom as well. So, so this kind of sexist imagery presents these women who, uh, who are not getting married as being very selfish, very am overly ambitious, overly picky they they don't want to get married and they're being 
you know, not doing the right thing. Um, so that's sort of where the term leftover women comes from. Um, this is this is this image here is taken from a People's Daily article that was published at the very end, uh, December of 2015, just when the government announced that it was easing the one child policy and it was going to implement the new two child policy. It completely changed uh, its tone, did a 180 degree turn with its propaganda. And after 30 plus years of um, coercing women to have only uh, one or two children, um, and you know, it's been extensively written about the kinds of human rights abuses, things like um, there were certainly reports of forced abortions, female infanticide, all kinds of horror stories about the forcible implementation of um, the one child policy. Um, and then all of a sudden the propaganda apparatus comes out and says, oh, well, women should have two children and uh, and this was the headline for this People's Daily article. Female university students with babies have brighter job prospects. And the subtitle was Student Moms on the Rise. This article is literally encouraging college students who are women to start having babies. And this was the picture that they used. And if you'll notice, there is no face. Um, uh, on this image, uh, but there is the discernible mortarboard showing that this is a mother figure holding a baby um, and this, the mother is educated. But really what counts is that uh, she has the baby there. So this is another People's Daily um, online article from 2017 and the headline for this was, You'd better believe it, under 30 are women's best years for getting pregnant. And so um, this is just another heavy theme in propaganda is that young women, and this is another one talking about how female college students can have babies. And the subtitle was female university students joyful love, freshman year live together, sophomore year get pregnant, junior year have baby. Um, so here's one image of a, you know, very conventionally attractive young university graduate holding one of her kids. Her kid is already a toddler and her hand is sort of caressing her visibly pregnant belly. And then on, on the right is um, all of these other women who've just graduated from college or perhaps they have a master's degree and they're cooing around this baby pram. Um, and so this is the kind of propaganda that, so it's not just negative insults hurled that are incredibly sexist hurled at women trying to, to make them feel like they have to hurry up and marry. The propaganda also tries to present very rosy scenarios for women, um, for very young women trying to show that actually they can be extremely happy um, and beautiful if they have a baby and being in college is no reason to put off having a, a child. Or, or, but of course, the marriage part is extremely important. Um, and it, I can get into that a little bit later too, but, um, but, the, but it's, it's, it, it is very important um, even, even with the three child policy, which is in place now, if you're a single woman, you, and if you're not married, you're still heavily penalized if you have a baby. And so, um, it looks as though some provinces are introducing, uh, new relaxed requirements, uh, allowing single women to have babies, but that's still very, uncertain. It's uncertain what direction that's going to take because marriage is very important for political stability. If you recall, going back to the images of Xi Jinping and, and how the nation state um, is comprised of all of these millions of families that are in the politically stabilizing institution of a marriage. So, uh, so I, I don't, 
I don't know if the government is really going to go all out and say anybody can have babies. I, I am not sure about that. Now, another thing that is very important to consider is that the leftover women uh, propaganda of uh, trying to pressure educated, college educated women into getting married and having babies, that is targeting Han Chinese women who are in the majority. Now, when you look at the government policy towards Uyghur or even Kazakh women or, or other Muslim women, um, in Xinjiang, it's the complete opposite. And this, this is why it's so important to understand the notion of suzhi or, or quality, a quality of the population, because while the government is pushing this propaganda, targeting uh, Han Chinese women who are college educated, trying to get those women to get married, the marriage rates are and uh, birth rates are falling among Han Chinese women. But the government is actually uh, deliberately slashing the birth rates among Uyghur and Kazakh women. And uh, even the United Nations actually came to the same conclusion that this, this is something that has been a policy carried out by the government. Um, and just to give you some of the thinking behind this policy, in 2015, there was a Communist Party official in Xinjiang who said that high birth rates in southern Xinjiang, quote, negatively affects population quality in the region, posing risks to social stability. Um, and then uh, in 2017, this was after the government had already uh, eased the one child policy and it had introduced a two child policy. Um, and then in 2017, in addition to introducing the two child policy, it ended dec a decades long policy that allowed minorities, ethnic minorities in China to have one child more than Han Chinese families. And the reason that the government gave for this policy change was uh, in, in, in order to uh, achieve ethnic equality. So what happened was Han Chinese um, women were allowed to have two children. And so that means that there, it was a more permissive birth rate um, allowed for Han Chinese women, but it was much, much more restrictive for Uyghur and other ethnic minority women because minority women in China ever since 1949 have been allowed to have more children. It's been part of this um, overall policy directed towards ethnic minorities to, to try to minimize um, unrest, but they ended that policy. So when they ended that policy, basically the two child policy was what they were using, the government was using to go in and they started enforcing this. And so these pictures on the bottom right is a woman, a Uyghur woman, Zumrat Dawood, who um, has spoken a lot to the media about, and I also interviewed her um, about being forcibly sterilized um, after she had her third child. And then she was, so uh, she was fined. A, a lot of women were, um, have been interviewed by many, many different sources, including, you know, the United Nations in their report, that there's copious evidence that there was a campaign of forcible sterilization carried out for women who've had more than three children in Xinjiang. And, and that, of course, is related to the mass detention of Uyghurs as well. But that it's important to keep that in mind because this is part of um, a nationwide policy to engineer a particular kind of population that is quote unquote high quality. So it's not just about raw numbers of births or marriage marriages. So I want to end uh, my this part of the talk before I get into the Q&A. Um, I mean, I think if you look at everything that I've shown you, it's not, it's uh, not a particularly optimistic picture for women's rights under Xi Jinping. Um, I 
actually was looking at the propaganda every in updating this uh, 10th anniversary edition of my book, Leftover Women, I went back and looked up every single example that I wrote about from um, in my first book, uh, with the, the original edition, which was published in 2014. I looked up every single example of propaganda. And what was surprising to me was that the number of those state media propaganda reports that are still being regurgitated is really pretty surprising. A lot of that propaganda is still being regurgitated word for word, being republished. And a, a lot of it is uh, word for word. And then sometimes because there is more, there's a lot more feminist awareness now um, which I didn't really get into so much, but um, I wrote about that a lot in my second book, Betraying Big Brother, about this feminist awakening in China. Um, but uh, because the term leftover women, I mean, I wrote about it extensively going all the way back to, to 2011 um, in Chinese as well as English. And so there's much more awareness about how Sheng Nu, that that's a propaganda campaign. It's very insulting. Um, it's very sexist. And so um, that has contributed to this feminist awakening in China. So, uh, but what is surprising to me is that there still continues to be this incredibly misogynistic propaganda that is trying to uh, push the notion that women need to marry, but that it's having the opposite effect. It's really turning young women off marriage and having babies altogether. And, and, and uh, the policy on divorce as well is making it, um, I'm gonna stop in just a couple of minutes here and so that we can take questions. Uh, but, but this is a huge factor in the plummeting marriage rates and birth rates is that um, young women, especially women who've gone to college are just uh, much more feminist, much more aware of the entrenched nature of sexism in Chinese society all around them. Um, there's been a very um, organized feminist movement. Um, I didn't get into that at this presentation, but I write a lot about it. Um, it really took off in 2015 with the jailing of five feminist activists. Um, and and this, this picture here on the top shows you, this is actually um, from a Wall Street Journal picture, uh, a Wall Street Journal article about these. There, there are some of the more hardcore radical feminist activists in China have, have left China, um, were uh, severely persecuted. Some of them have been jailed. Some of them are still in jail or detention. Um, but these feminists have for many, many years been calling for, as part of their calls for the emancipation of women, have been talking about resisting marriage and child rearing. Um, and so the government has been carrying out a really brutal anti-feminist crackdown ever since 2015. Um, in 2017, the People's Daily first said that, quote unquote, Western hostile forces are using, quote, Western feminism to interfere in China's handling of women's affairs. Um, and another thing that is really uh, worth paying attention to is that this so-called white paper movement at the end of last year, just a few um, months ago, this was a, a series of pretty large protests that took place in dozens of cities across China. And it was a protest against China's zero COVID policies. And right after these protests, um, the government actually did uh, end the zero COVID campaign. What was very striking about these white paper protests is the, the large number of young women on the front lines of the protests taking leadership roles. And another thing that I didn't even bring up, but you may wanna ask me about is, the Me Too movement in China. That's also very closely related to the feminist movement. So I'm going to stop sharing 
And um, I would be happy to take people's questions now. Thank you, Dr. Hong Pincho. This is a remarkable analysis of women in society in China. Um, and we are at the end of the program, but we will um, take those Q&A questions for, uh, for y'all um, as we wrap up here. So we do have a, a first question um, from <clears throat> uh, saying, asking some trusted ecologists, Dr. William Reeves, for example, are suggesting that the ecological overshoot is now unstoppable. It will be the mechanism for population correction as humans seem incapable of taking effective action despite decades of scientific warnings. In this light, the population decline in China would be seen as an appropriate to a world that no longer delivers low cost hydro hydrocarbons. In other words, fewer would die of starvation if the population were better matched to local food production without hydrocarbon energy. Would you care to wade into this kind of thinking? <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for the question. So I certainly, we don't mean to suggest at all that population decline is necessarily a bad thing. I think I should have said that population decline is viewed by the Chinese government as a severe crisis. And that underlies all of these other things, um, the alarm about falling birth rates and marriage rates. Um, it's really, uh, so, so um, yeah, I mean, I don't actually think that um, the declining population per se needs to be a problem for China at all. And, and in fact, you know, there are so many things that the government could do. It could, for example, um, open its borders and encourage immigration into China. Um, I mean, the workforce is shrinking, and so that's an economic problem. It's going to be very difficult for the Chinese government to maintain high levels of GDP growth from now on, which is certainly one of the things that um, Xi Jinping and other Communist Party leaders are extremely worried about, is uh, how to maintain economic development when the population is shrinking, the workforce is shrinking, um, it's an unbalanced population structure so that the elderly, you know, there is a much growing, the growing share of the elderly compared to the working age population. But of course, the government could just invite immigrants in. It's not doing that. Another thing that the government could do is to encourage more women, encourage women en masse to find work, find paid work. But you never see that mentioned in any of the propaganda. Xi Jinping has given a lot of speeches about this. Uh, he never talks about how important women are for the economy. Um, and I write quite a lot about growing gender discrimination against um, women who are looking for work or for, are looking for promotions. Um, another thing is that the youth unemployment rate is around 20% now, which is incredibly high. Um, and so what are all these young people going to do? Um, and so part of the solution the Chinese government has seen as a, 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 an all encompassing solution is to push women back into the home. Uh, it is not concerned at all about um, uh, the dropping female labor force participation rate, which I also didn't mention, but I write a lot about that in the, in the book. So yes, I do not mean to suggest that population decline per se is a bad thing. Um, so, uh, so that's a very good question. Thank you. After giving the background that you did, um, what do you see as the future for women's rights in China? Well, um, so it, I mean, it, I, I think that it's very ominous overall that, that um, there are going to be a lot of new obstacles for women. Um, and the gender discrimination is already getting a lot worse. The female labor force participation rate has dropped a lot. Um, and given that the Chinese government is adopting this really pro-natalist policy, the three child policy, um, that so far 
what we see is just uh, propaganda, which is why I kind of, it also makes like, is more visually interesting to see the propaganda. Um, and so far, you know, they've just announced that there are going to be these new pilot projects in 20 more cities, um, encouraging young people to have children and get married and educating young people about so-called appropriate ages for marriage and, and childbirth. Um, but effectively what that translates to for women is inevitably going to be more coercion. And so one thing that I did not mention, we just don't have enough evidence yet, but I am very concerned. Um, I know that there, I mean, everybody knows the Chinese government looks at the United States really carefully. And we see in the US, you know, the overturning of Roe versus Wade and all of these abortion bans um, introduced in all of these states. And this is a huge problem. It's a huge battle happening in America. And um, I certainly am concerned th that it would be a very logical step for the Chinese government to impose much tighter restrictions on abortion in China. But there isn't a nationwide announcement that that's going to happen yet in China. But effectively, that's the direction that the country is moving towards. Now, why hasn't the government actually announced an abortion ban? I mean, this is where I am actually hopeful because even though I'm very pessimistic about government policies about women's rights, um, I mean, the government's going to continue to push uh, very qualified, educated women into the home um, and, and increase gender discrimination. But what I am very encouraged by is this new feminist awakening um, that young, uh, young, primarily young women, but it's, it's also just young people, young men or you know, non-binary people, um, they uh, are really pushing back against this incredibly strong pressure to marry and have babies. And uh, it's, yes, China is an authoritarian country. It's a one party state. And under Xi Jinping, he himself is so much more of a dictator than anybody um, except for Mao Zedong. And so there's a lot to be concerned about um, under Xi Jinping. Nonetheless, I'm really, um, I'm hopeful because I see from the ground up so many young people and young, young women in particular who are, uh, who are just pushing back against all of this, this pressure. Um, they're taking more bold, um, steps against the government as well. Um, and, and that gives them leverage because the Chinese government doesn't want a full scale revolution on its hands. And I think that if there were to be some kind of announcement like announcing a nationwide abortion ban, that, you know, that we might see the Communist Party completely toppled if that were to happen. And so, and so, uh, so that really gives me hope. Um, and that, that feminist movement is very, very interesting. And it's not, just the, it's not just the movement, it's just growing consciousness among young people in general about um, the importance of standing up for your rights. Thank you. Um, one question says, you presented the propaganda on women in China, and does your research show that the propaganda has been effective? And in what ways, I guess? And as far as um, this person knows, I believe they're from China. <clears throat> it, many people in China don't buy such propaganda anymore. Is it wasted effort? Yeah, so this is a really good question. And I myself have asked myself this question, you know, all the, for, for a long time. Um, because even when I was uh, writing my first book, which actually grew out of my 
PhD thesis in sociology um, at Tsinghua University in Beijing. And by the way, I, there's no way I would be able to do that PhD now um, in this repressive political climate today. But I, I had a remarkable, looking back, it's remarkable how much freedom I had to do the research that I did um, uh, 10 years ago. Um, so the propaganda, at the time that the propaganda first came out in 2007, it was very aggressive, misogynistic. I think that it that really did scare a lot of young women um, into getting married because I, I, I mean, I at the time I was interviewing a lot of these women and they, they were getting married. Um, some of these women did not even like the men that they were marrying. They let alone love them, but they were genuinely afraid that if they didn't marry, they would become some, you know, horrible shengnu, leftover woman, and that they would never be able to find a marriage partner. But, um, but even back then, the pressure, I think that that propaganda um, was aimed more at the parents, an older generation. And this is, I, I actually write a, a lot about, you know, the sophistication of the propaganda and how it's used and the role of elders in pressuring their children and particularly their daughters. Um, so it's very true. Young people completely ignore, not just ignore, I mean, they, they laugh at this propaganda because, I mean, it is, it is so crass, it is so deeply insulting completely out of touch with the sensibilities of young people in China. But it has to be said that propaganda is effective with the older generations. And the older generations are, are still, even though young people in China are, are much more progressive in their values and their thinking about gender roles and about everything, this notion of filial piety, which is honoring your parents, is still very deeply entrenched, even among the most progressive young people in China. So yes, there are, um, uh, there are young people who do not care or they say they don't care what their parents tell them or their grandparents say to them, but a lot of young people really do care. And they're, and they're really heartbroken at, um, at having to say no to their parents. But that is really what is happening is that when you see, especially young women, um, you know, or people who are able to have babies saying no to their parents, saying, no, I don't want to get married and no, I don't even want to have a baby. That, that is a heartbreaking uh, tension. That's, it's, it, it often means severing ties or it can mean, it can be as extreme as having to sever ties with your parents because your parents or maybe some other elder has been, is so invested in trying to push, um, especially the daughter to marry and have a baby that, you know, they just won't let up. And then, and then the young woman can't, can't stand it anymore and says, you know, I, I can't talk to, uh, I can't talk to my mother. It's, often it's actually ironically, um, you know, the, this internalized sexism, often it's the mother who exerts the most pressure, but it's the parents collectively and the elders. Um, and so, yeah, the propaganda is still sadly of use, even though the young people, uh, it's the young people who are the ones who are supposed to get married and have babies, and they will you know, laugh at the propaganda or, or, or be very angry about it. But, um, but the propaganda, I think, is not primarily aimed at the young people. It's, if it can change the mind, and it definitely has changed the minds of older people. And the older people are the ones with all the money. And another thing I didn't even mention at all in my presentation, it has to do with gender inequality and the real estate boom and the purchasing of housing in, in China, which is a whole very complicated dynamic. But young people are very dependent on their elders for purchasing homes. Um, and so th this is another way that the government is pushing marriage 
is by linking um, favorable housing purchase policies to people, young people who get married. And so this is a lot of young people will marry just in just to buy a home. And so it's all connected. There is just pressure on all sides, pushing young people, especially women, into getting married and having, uh, especially getting married when they don't want to. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. <laughs> Um, uh, this person, I'm gonna. She has two questions here, but um, she wondered if Western influence more or more or less is Western influence more or less than it has been previously or under censorship. And then, in summary, what is your greatest hope and greatest fear for today's Chinese women? Western influence. I'm not exactly sure how to interpret that i mean i mean i say that um you know china has always been, has been very well not always but if you look at the 20th century and the may 4th movement which by the way is still celebrated by the communist party um the may 4th movement itself is now cast as a really patriotic nationalistic thing um, but in fact, it, in, you know, it, it, uh, gender played a really important role in the May 4th movement, um, 19, I mean, the May 4th era, the May 4th protest itself was 1919, but, but at that time, the turn of the 20th century, um, so many Chinese, including the communists, by the way, I mean, all sorts of influential communist figures like Zhou Enlai, for example, um, Deng Xiaoping, um, spent a lot of time, formative years abroad, learning from, uh, you know, uh, learning from the West. And what is what is the Soviet Union? I mean, <laughs> the whole system of communism and Leninism was imported wholesale, completely copied from the Soviet Union. Marxist Leninism. It's that's Western. So what does that mean? Western influence. So, um, so the Communist Party propaganda in recent years has, you know, warned about the dangers of so-called hostile Western influences. But I mean, West, you know, the Communist Party itself is a, in, an import from the West, from the Soviet Union, if, if you want to call the Soviet Union West. Um, so that's uh, that question. And then the other is, I mean, what, yeah, what is my greatest fear? I mean, one, I, I mean, I don't want to really say what my greatest fear is because it could be very bad. Um, but I, and I, but I did already mention that I do have, I do worry that um, abortion is going to become more and more restricted in China. And that, that is a, that is a worry. Um, but, on, but on the hopeful side, I, I'm I'm really I'm really heartened. Oh, by um, actually, this is I don't know if it's possible to play. Um, there's this video just as an example of feminist activism in China. Um, you know, it's probably too complicated to show you, but uh, but these Chinese feminist activists put together a video um, that was very widely circulated on social media and. Um, or maybe somebody could pop that into the chat, a link. There's, a, uh, there's a, an account on Twitter. There are a number of different Chinese feminist accounts. Oh, thank you so much. So I think Joan put this Twitter link into the chat. It's difficult to, it's better if you just play this by yourself because you can hear it. Um, this is an example of a Chinese feminist action and this one it, you can see that they they there are these dozens of feminist activists who unfurl this big banner uh that reveals a picture of um the so-called chained woman this woman who was discovered chained and having forced to give birth to eight babies and it's a really horrifying 
story that went viral on um, Weibo and other social media in China and the entire country was talking about how scandalous it was. Um, and then, but then there were these other uh, feminists who were traveling to the region to try and investigate what happened with the detained women. And they themselves were detained by police. So, um, but the thing is that I'm very heartened by the incredible resilience of this feminist movement um, and the fact that so many just ordinary young people are much more aware of sexism and much more aware of the importance and the difference that they can make speaking out even in such a tightly controlled environment with incredibly intense internet censorship and surveillance there's still a lot of room for young people to kind of discuss their ideas and to talk about, you know, whether or not they um, should be getting married if they don't want to, whether or not they should have a baby if they don't want to. And um, I, I'm very hopeful about the possibilities of um, feminist organizing. And, and I know that sounds really um, like an oxymoron, uh, but, but it's not, it, China's not a totalitarian state. And so there is, um, I mean, it's, it's more dangerous with Xi Jinping as effectively a one man rule, as opposed to in the past, it was ruled by consensus by the senior, you know, standing committee or the Politburo. Um, but today it's much more dangerous because Xi Jinping himself is basically controlling China. So it's much more of a dictatorship under him. But even under Xi Jinping, there is still room, at least right now. And I think that it, it will persist for a while longer. And, and the young people still have a lot of um, imagination and they're able to get around. The constraints are con tightening and, and uh, increasing, but they, but uh, this feminist pushback is, is pretty ingenious and so far very resilient. So that's what gives me hope. Okay, on that note, we're going to end this program. Thank you so much to Dr. Holm Fincher for sharing your research and your expertise today. This is such a fascinating um, discussion and I hope everyone will read your book because I'm, <laughs> I'm excited for the new revision. It'll be very, very excellent. Um, and to everybody here, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is our last webinar for the academic year. We hope to see you again in the fall. So everybody have a great summer. Thanks very much. <laughs>